effort to declare a national emergency. Well, you keep asking it, and I'm going to keep giving you the answer that he continues to give, which is that he has the absolute right to do it. He's examined it. He's vetted it with his legal team. And in my view, that would be a, a, a tool or an action of last resort, not first resort. He's tried to have Congress do its job. He tried to work with a Republican-led Congress and now a Democratic-led Congress to do its job and get this country an immigration reform package, including a physical barrier that you can't climb over, or crawl under, or drive through, or walk around, as much of the video footage shows that you can currently in, in places and spaces. And so he doesn't want, he hasn't wanted to do that. He's wanted Congress to do its job. He's respecting the process. He'll see through the 21 days, the February 15th deadline. Um, he has expressed a, a low degree of confidence in the process because Speaker Pelosi herself keeps going out there and giving one word responses like dollar, no. And, and she just seems incredibly sarcastic given her role. At least come to the table and tell us, to what do you and your conference object, Speaker Pelosi? Is it the DAC and TPS fixes? Is it the 2,750 new Border Patrol agents? Is it, is it the 75 more immigration judges to try to release the pressure of the 800,000 case backlog that we have? Backlog that we have. Is it the $800 million, including detention beds and humanitarian assistance? Is it the additional $800 million for technology and other drug detection measures? All the things that Democrats have said, Jeff, that they wanted over time. We're, are in this package that the president put forward. We've never even gotten a response from her except no $1, uh, no wall. But I did notice yesterday that she also said, well, if he wants to call it, you know, if it's if it's fencing, maybe there's, there's something for fencing if he wants to call it a wall. And he's told them, and if you want to call it a fence. As I said on a couple Sunday shows three or four weeks ago, let's not have a silly semantics argument. Call it what you want, but get it so that it's a physical barrier that keeps the drugs out of our communities and keeps the and, and, and stops encouraging people to take their young children on this perilous journey being promised by coyotes to whom they give their entire life savings. Uh, promised things that just can't be delivered upon. Kelly, and just to be clear, was that a possible area of compromise? Because when I heard Speaker Pelosi say that, I thought maybe that is the area what of is that? agreement when she talked about the fencing. She said, call it what you want, as you just said. The would president the president said that in the Situation Room weeks ago yesterday to her. Yesterday he said a wall is a wall. So would he sign off on that? Well, that's his way of telling them, you can call it fencing. We know it's a wall. He calls it a wall. They want to call it fencing. Kristen, I'll repeat what I've said before. For those, including Senator Schumer, Senator Biden, Senator Clinton, Senator Obama, no longer vote there, but obviously leaders of the Democratic Party, they voted for the Secure Fences Act in 2006. Why is that relevant? They can call this the Secure Fences Act of 2019 if they'd like. I'm sure we can arrange that. But call it what you want, but get the darn thing done. Because Congress has fallen down on, uh, on its job. Republican-led Congress, Democratic-led Congress. You're not going to get an argument from me on that. The president was promised by the Republican-led Congress that he would get that wall funding when he signed that omnibus spending pa package that did not include a sufficient amount for it. And yet now we have courts making immigration law for the entire country because Congress will not do its job. And apologies, I have a headache, so very quickly. Uh, the president's Nine. reaction to the other big news of the day, what is his reaction to Senator Cory Booker announcing he's running? President joining a very crowded Democratic Well, the president field. has said before that Cory Booker, as mayor of Newark, ha ran the, quote, city into the ground, so I'll let those comments stand. I saw in, in his, I think Cory Booker often sounds like a Hallmark card and not uh, necessarily a, a, a person who's there to tell you everything he's accomplished in the United States Senate and as mayor of Newark. So we'll wait to look at his record. I imagine that the crowded Democratic field of presidential aspirants will be attacking each other's records or lack thereof, so we'll be sitting back with copious bowls of popcorn watching that. But at the same time, um, as a resident, as a person who grew up in New Jersey and raised my children there before we moved here, I, I don't know what's in Senator Booker's record that he's going to be able to point to and say, let me bring this to the entire nation. I did notice in his in his words today, he says something about being born into this country. So I'd like to ask him and the rest of the 2020 field, when you were, when you use the word born, would that include sometime around the ninth month? Do you agree with what's going on in Virginia and New York, that children who are close to being born in the eighth and ninth month can survive out of the womb viably? And in the case of Virginia, in the words of the governor, that as far as I know, he hasn't retracted, the baby's already born, it will, quote, keep the infant comfortable, and then have the mother consult with the physician? Is this America? Is this serious? Is that what it is to be pro-choice now? I think so. 
because as a pro-lifer who works for a pro-life president who masterfully and famously said to Hillary Clinton on October 19, 2016, you're the extremist on abortion. You're the one that ripped that baby out of its mother's uh, womb an hour before it's being born. And lo and behold, here we are in Virginia, in New York, and in other places. So I would ask Cory Booker and Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren and the hundred people who I guess will run for president on the Democratic side, when do you believe life begins? Are you going to look in the eye of people like Gabby Ke Pat Kevis of New Jersey, who was born at 23 and a half weeks and is now a thriving four-year-old? Should she have been aborted? Should she have been aborted at 23 and a half weeks, 16 weeks after that? We have to have a serious conversation about what it means in modern America to call yourself pro-choice in 2000, uh, 2019. And I will say one other thing. All these Democrats, including those who represent large states in the Senate, it looks like they're going to spend 2019 running for president. Donald Trump's going to spend 2019 being the president, and that's the difference. And that's why he'll get reelected. Kelly, okay, back on the wall, uh, Congressional Research Service put something out, I think just this week, and suggested there are a couple ways around the president declaring an emergency, still getting a lot of money in these, uh, by simply declaring uh, there's an issue with drugs on the border, declaring this is an issue of national security. Uh, is it possible the president's going to? make a move that doesn't uh, declare a national emergency, doesn't trigger a whole bunch of... The president has said several times, Joe, more than several times publicly, that he has many different options. He's been reviewing different options, and that includes a national declaration of a national emergency, but it includes other options as well. So I'll leave it at that, and the president and his team will, uh, will make announcements uh, when we're ready. But in the meantime, we're seeing out the congressional process. It sounds like you don't have a high level of confidence in the congressional process. So we, the president said yesterday to the New York Times that he will, you know, he's going to see it out until February 15th. Obviously, he will address these issues in his State of the Union on Tuesday night as well. Time to really unify the country, talk about the accomplishments, but really the vision forward. And again, he's the only person I see who's absolutely positively going to be on the ballot in 2020 who's actually doing anything in 2019 other than running for president. Kelly, and two more things on border security. Uh, first, the president signed a couple of years back an executive order to um, promote the hiring of more Border Patrol agents. Um, most of those agents have not been hired. Why hasn't the president made it a higher priority to encourage the hiring of those agents? Well, he has, one? but uh, he has, and he'll leave that to CPB and DHS to take care of actually filling those jobs. But it is a high priority to him. But we, we know that it's bipartisan. There's bipartisan support for having more patrol, Border Patrol agents at the border. We've talked to Democrats who believe that. We've the Senator Shelby letter that came from OMB to Chairman Shelby, dated January 6th, now almost a month ago, included that on the back page. That was one of the items that the Democrats had wanted, or that they said that many of them could support. Um, but look what's happening just in this seizure in Arizona to Port of Entry over last weekend and release. I guess the news was released yesterday. We've known about it for a while. Uh, that shows you the great work that the Border Patrol agents are doing, and it shows you why we need more of them, one of the many reasons we need more of them. They're also stopping the human trafficking, the sex trafficking. The President will have an event today about human trafficking actually here at the White House. I hope you'll tune in. Uh, we also really want to push back on those um, several now at this point extreme left of center Democrats who are calling for the, the abolition of ICE, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They too are helping with the smuggling, with the drugs, um, with, the, with the human trafficking. And we want to make sure that they have more resources and more respect. But filling those jobs, uh, putting qualified people in those jobs, obviously is a top priority. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't even be, as you see, the surge coming up from the Northern Triangle, as we know that the flow of immigration has just shifted. For years and years, it was predominantly single males coming from Mexico looking for, um, coming as economic migrants. Now, of course, you know increasingly it's these unaccompanied children. It's these family units coming from the Northern Triangle countries. And so the flow itself demands more personnel on the border. They feel stretched. I've talked to them. I hope some of you have talked to them. Um, they've made themselves available to the media and to the public many times. And so that continues to be a priority, filling those jobs and making sure that they have the resources and the respect and the, the additional personnel that they need. And Last on one. negotiations, Kellyanne, um, how is the president not undermining, particularly Republicans, as they're trying to work with Democrats on the issue of border security when he says he doesn't really expect things to work out? No, he's letting the process work and he's being realistic. He's being realistic because 
he dealt with, tried to deal with the Democrats for 35 days. Occasionally they came to the White House, but they never truly came to the table. Because coming to the White House is different than coming to the table. You come to the table and you say things other than, no, dollar. And then no response, complete crickets in response to the President's public proposal, made publicly in the Oval Office a couple of Saturdays ago, to have a complete package on immigration, which included TPS and DACA. It also included the technology, the money for humanitarian needs, billions and billions of dollars for all of the above. We, to this moment, have never received a counteroffer to that. No is not a counteroffer. It's a childlike response that shows that, you, that you're, you're shutting down any kind of a talk. And I think that's why the conferees are people other than the speaker. I think the conferees are, are people who are trying to seriously come to an agreement that a majority of the Congress can agree upon and put on the President's desk. He is willing to sign something he believes secures the southern border and adds to our need technologically, personnel-wise, judicially, obviously more immigration judges. He's been willing to do that. He's already come, he's compromised, and he's come off of the original asks many, many times. But I think that's why you see, you saw the Problem Solvers Caucus, caucus come here. We have other Democrats, uh, like, like Senator Joe Manchin, voting for the President's proposal last week, or the package last week that included money for the wall and other enhancements, uh, because they go home and they get an earful, and you know that. You travel with them sometimes. They, they go home and they say, look, we, we want to make sure these drugs aren't pouring in our, in our communities. I mean, I work on the drug crisis here every day. If you're not covering, if you're not telling Americans what fentanyl is, the CDC says it's increasingly the most lethal part of the drug crisis. It's, if you look at the CDC numbers, it's, it's actually a vertical line upward in the number of fentanyl-related deaths in this country because a tiny little grain is a lethal amount, God forbid, to kill someone of, of your size or my size. Tiny little grain. And yet they interdicted 254 pounds of it, enough to kill over 50 million Americans. Street value of 102 million is probably buried everywhere today is a story. That's news we can all use. That's relevant information. And that is in large part why the president keeps talking about the drugs pouring in, having the Chinese president, Mr. Xi, make good on his promise to schedule it as a controlled substance, thereby making it a crime punishable at the highest levels in China. There's a direct nexus between what is being manufactured illicitly in their labs and what is being brought into this country. And I would say to every single Democrat that voted, thank you for voting, but every single Democrat that voted for the most, most historic piece of legislation on any one drug crisis in our nation's history, just a few short, about six months ago, they voted for they voted for that because they know drugs are a problem in their communities, in this country, in their states. They voted for money to give uh, Border Patrol through the Interdict Act, it's an acronym, more money um, to detect and analyze fentanyl. Uh, they, and handle fentanyl, they voted for the STOP Act as part of H.R. 6, which would compel our own U.S. Postal Service, our own government, our own U.S. Postal Service to, um, to require packages coming from foreign countries to say, sender, recipient, and the contents to stop the, the flow of drugs coming in. They've all admitted that it's a problem through that vote on H.R. 6, so why aren't they coming to the table now? They don't want to go on record saying Donald Trump got his wall through my vote. Call it whatever they want. They can call it anything they want, but make it a serious physical barrier that people can't crawl under, climb over, walk around, or drive through so that we can impede the flow of drugs and coming over this border and stop encouraging these, these mothers to take these children on these perilous journeys from the Northern Triangle countries, stop in Mexico, and remain there while your fear of, of, your fear of asylum is, or your fear and your asylum claim is being processed on this side of the border. Stay on that side of the border where you have a visa, you have work, you have safety, you have your humanitarian needs met. That's our message to them. Don't take the perilous journey in the first place. The president has said, be one of the 33 million Americans who came here legally. We'd love to add to those ranks. He wants people to come here, to immigrate here legally. He has said that many times, and I'm repeating it on his behalf. I have a 915 meeting. Anyone else? Kellen, yes, I have one yet. Thank you. Yesterday, the president said he expects unification and unity to be a major message of his State of the Union speech. And then he immediately, in the next breath, started to assail Democrats over border security and the border wall. So what would you say to Democrats who are contemplating whether they're going to come to the State of the Union address on Tuesday and fear that it might just be a lecture in prime time on border security? Is and that what they fear? Things? Well, the president, uh, 
of course, is going to be a unifying figure. He is the leader of the country, and he certainly is the leader of the country at the State of the Union. It's his opportunity once a year to look the American people in the eye, cut out the middleman respectfully until the panels talk afterwards, and to convey to them many things they don't hear throughout the year. The record of accomplishment, the facts and figures of his great economy today, with 304,000 new jobs created, well above the 170,000 that were projected. So he will say things like that, showing the economy strong, but he's also, as he said, it's going to be unifying, unifying. He knows on criminal justice reform, on the drug legislation, on any number of issues, Republicans and Democrats have proven they can come together and work for, toward the common purpose of serving the American people. He believes border security is a nonpartisan issue that should have bipartisan solutions. But many things fall into that category. He may ask Democrats. I'm not going to tell you what's in the speech. I've seen it, but maybe he'll ask Democrats in, in, in view of the new news. Why do you object to the pain capable bill that nonpartisan scientists say a baby can feel pain after the 20th week? And now we've got, we've got governors and state legislators in many places, but most illustratively and recently in New York and Virginia saying that a baby can be can have his or her life snuffed out of it, out of him or her, 20 weeks after 20 weeks. And this is who we are as Americans. But he is going to um, call for action, call for bipartisan action on a number of issues. And he continues to do that. And you know, I don't think that the, that the Speaker of the House, respectfully, sounds very unifying. Most days she sounds like a cable news pundit when she goes out there and says, well, does the president do this president? She doesn't sound like a unifying figure. And I know she represents San Francisco, which is a little slice of the country and not very representative. I know she's a very wealthy woman and not very representative of the rest of the country, but she should think about her words also, get a little bit better control of her temper and her chamber. And those who don't show up for the State of the Union, that's on them, not on the president. They need to explain to their, their constituents why they thought so little of the people they represent that they refuse to sit in the hallowed chamber in the Capitol and listen to our president come forward and try to call for bipartisan action on any number of measures. That's on them. That's not on him. How much Killian. of his speech will he be using to uh, address board issues? Well, he, like you saw yesterday and you saw just this morning with our Secretary of State, uh, the president spends a good part of every day thinking about the nation's intelligence, security, a foreign policy, certainly, endless wars, as he calls them, in places like Syria and Afghanistan, where he thinks that we have spent enormous treasure, most of all, uh, our young men and women who have perished there. And uh, of course, he will be addressing that at the State of the Union as, as well as domestic issues. You said you've seen the speech. Is, the speech. is, is it done? Pulling out of INF to spark a nuclear arms race. We heard the Secretary of State's uh, comments, our chief diplomat, and I would I would say to all these, all of you who continue to say on and on and on, as do the people in your respective networks and in your print publications, your online publications for that matter, that uh, the president is so soft on Russia, is he? I mean, listen to those words today, see the action that Secretary of State Pompeo took today, and couple that up, marry that up with the 60 Russians that have been expelled from this country, the two consulates that have been closed, the sanctions that our Treasury Department has leveled time and again, and not just on Russia, on North Korea. Those sanctions remain in place while we try to take steps forward toward complete denuclearization. That's a process. Uh, those countries have been at war for almost 70 years, obviously, and if the President and Chairman Kim could meet and could meet again soon to try to go toward the goal of denuclearization, he's willing to do that. But in the meantime, the sanctions remain, and I think you saw yet again today, whether you want to see it or not, the American people see it, a President who is willing to stand up for America and not stand down to Russia and Putin. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly.